you will not be as old driving at 60 miles per hour. Now, the difference in time is really negligible. Until you get close to the speed limit. Typically, physicists don't worry about it until you're at 10% the speed of light. When you have an object traveling 30 million meters a second, then you start to care. So you're telling me I might not actually be 21 breaking the wall. That is true. I guess you speed a lot. <laughs> that, that's what I pulled from that one. Isn't it like, uh, isn't it, and I know it's not really realistic that you can't go faster than the speed of light, but if you were to, you go back in time? All right, uh, time would have to be redefined, so it becomes a lot trickier there. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about that for an instant. And this is something where sort of the belief has come out of the math. So we have this time, let's put it back into the full form. Time is equal to the proper time over the square root of one minus b squared over c squared. If you travel the speed of light, what would time be? Not t. Zero. You almost there. No, wait, what did you say? If you're traveling the speed of light, what would t be? One. Uh, you're miss, missing the extreme. Non-existent. Uh, from a math point of view, if sure. It would be, it'd be nothing, right? Uh, so let's be careful about the term nothing or non existent. Well, not, uh, yeah, I mean, it's undefined. So if V is equal to C, we basically get zero in the denominator. Undefined. Yeah. What would happen is that all time in the universe would, would pass. Syntax error. Have in. All right. So if V is equal to C, we get zero in the denominator. T basically, from a physicist's point of view, we would say infinite. Uh, from a math point of view, undefined. So all of, all of the existence of the universe would be gone. Even if you got there, if you went into, I'm about to say for a second, but that has no meaning here. If you went, go at the speed of light for however long you felt like and then came back out, the entire universe would be gone by the time you came back. An infinite amount of time would have passed in however long that you were going at the speed of light. So they say. True. Well, what they say though is that because there's a limit right here, this actually says that if you start out slower than the speed of light, you can't get there. So the claim is that you will never get to the speed of light. Because it, doesn't it become harder to move faster the closer you get to the speed of light? Because there are several things that change as you get faster. Mass changes. Now there's some who will claim it's not the mass, it's the momentum that changes, but like old school mass. So if I apply a force to a mass, in, in pre-relativity, I could, in theory, apply a constant force to a mass. The acceleration is the force divided by the mass. Acceleration means the velocity is changing. Let's assume it's speeding up. It gets faster and faster and faster. At some point, theoretically, I would pass the speed of light. What this says is that as it gets faster and faster, so as gamma gets bigger, my mass gets bigger, which means that if I apply the same force, the acceleration is going to drop. Because you're slow it's, down. Uh, not necessarily going to slow down, but you're not going to speed up as quickly. So what would happen is your velocity would, if that's the speed of light, your speed would basically get closer and closer and never quite hit. But this is how, in high energy physics experiments, this is how you get a slew of particles. As you zip that thing up near the speed of light, protons, electrons, really tiny things. They have so much mass built up into them, or energy, you know, at some point, mass and energy get used interchangeably. There's so much mass built up into it that when you smash it into something, you now can have, you have a lot of mass to conserve, and so you get a whole bunch of particles out of it. Questions to hear. That's how they invented the neutron bomb. Oh, uh, the theory behind it. The 
that would actually stem from what you're storing circuiting into the bombs. The famous equation E equals MC squared is where the, uh, where the nuclear bomb comes from because the what that is is the mass energy of every atom is that. So say you have the mass of an atom, you multiply it by the square root of the speed of light, and that's the total energy from the actual atom. So as you take, let's say, two hydrogen atoms, let's say bombs, this is how you make the bomb, get two hydrogen atoms and smash them together, you basically have a helium nucleus, but the mass of the helium nucleus is not the same as the total mass of the two particles you started with. So there's a loss of mass when you do that. That loss of mass comes out in energy of some form. Uh, in, in the case of the atomic bomb, you start with uranium, it breaks into two pieces and the other little bits. Uh, but the mass of what you end up with is less than what you started with, and that change in energy comes out in the forms of harmful stuff. Or plutonium. Well, I think of the radiation that's coming off of it. I mean, if you make a big enough bomb, you'd be able to like, blow everything up. Well, all right, so this is what you mean by everything. If you're talking about destroying the entire world, I, in theory, yes, but I don't think we have the resources to build a bomb that big. Yeah. Or the inclination. Because one, we prefer the slow kill. One gram of matter is approximately 43 kilotons of TNT. So you need, so one ton of mass would be 43 gigatons, which would annihilate an island. So you need a lot. Yeah. You need a lot to build a war. You need, no. a, you need to pull all our money together. <laughs> you need to overcome the gravitational binding energy of the Earth, which is 10 to 30, I think, joules. Uh, actually, I don't. I don't think of gravitational binding energy. Hmm? The, the because the, the gravitational force typically is uh, relatively weak compared to a lot of the other forces. To keep the Earth from breaking apart in half. I mean, it's strong enough for that, but there are other forces involved that I think would be more difficult. But I don't know. All right. <laughs> so anyway, you, you smash two hydrogens together, you get a certain energy mm -hmm. out. You smash, you take a uranium, split it in half, you get energy out. You get more energy out of the smashing of the two hydrogens together. The trouble is that, because they're trying to make the, a fusion reactor, uh, I think there are a couple prototypes out there they're trying to get going, but the amount of energy it takes to create the fusion process is really more than we're getting out of it at this point. And same with a hydrogen bomb. How do you get enough energy to slam the hydrogens together in order to cause the hydrogen bomb to go off? Well, we got one thing powerful enough to set off a hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen bomb. Uh, not quite that bad, the atomic bomb. So basically we have an atomic bomb with a uranium splitting which gives enough energy for the hydrogen bomb to work. Hydrogen bomb in and of itself is not radioactive, but the atomic bomb inside it is. So a bomb sets off a bigger bomb. Yes. Ooh. So there was a, a great visual, I guess. Imagine a ring of grenades, but each grenade is a bomb, an atomic bomb. And in the center is the hydrogen bomb. And the atomic bombs go off at the same time to create the hydrogen bomb. Yeah. And, and to be able to concentrate it too, there was a, I forget the name of the movie, I think it was George Clooney movie. At the end, they there's a bomb that they need to keep from going off. I was thinking it was that was just an atomic bomb. Did they put it in the ocean? No, they, it was on land. But basically you have all these blast plates which would direct all the energy in towards the middle to set off probably the bigger bomb. So it probably was a hydrogen bomb. And the way that they saved the day was to take one of the panels off so that the energy wasn't as concentrated in the middle to set the whole thing off. Is it a peacemaker? It's been many years. It could very easily be boring actors and movie, movies together. I just remember they taking the panel off in order to keep the bomb from doing as much damage. And he just come barging in. So 
Sorry about the interruption. We'll forgive you. Thank you. You got a fun shirt on Friday. I will have a fun shirt on Friday. Be sacrilege not to. All right, so all this is well and good, e equals mc squared, that proof comes up later. This whole idea of time dilation, is there any evidence for it? Yes, there is, otherwise I probably would not be talking about it right now. At least not to this extent. But the first, so I say it comes out with the stuff in 1905. It comes out with four major papers, three, uh, three of which could have gotten the Nobel Prize. The fourth one I can never remember. Ultimately, they could not deny Einstein's Nobel Prize in 1920, I believe it was. They finally gave him one, gave him one for contributions to physics. Although his contributions were far spread enough that it just, he deserved more than one. Did he get the million dollars with it? I don't think it was a million dollars at the time. At least it wasn't during the Great Depression, then it would have been less. Um, if I had to imagine, Einstein probably wouldn't care about the million dollars. Yeah, true. He probably, I, think, I think he's probably getting paid well enough. Right. All right, so 1915 uh, is the second major year for Einstein. He comes out with the math behind general relativity. Not the big difference between special and general relativity General relativity deals with accelerating reference frames. So if I have a, if I have a rocket ship that's accelerating, general relativity will handle that. Special relativity deals with what are called inertial frames or no acceleration. No objects are traveling at that speed. 1918 or 19, somewhere in there, was the first evidence that general relativity was true. It's a far more complex thing, but the evidence came up first. 1941 was the first evidence for this to be true in the Rossi Hall experiment. These are two different people. So they went up to the uh, top of Mount Washington in New Hampshire, and they set up a cloud chamber. Cloud chamber, actually the, the predecessor of the early college chemistry teacher set up a cloud chamber in the other room uh, at one point. Cloud chambers, you get this, a super, in a sense, superheated gas, so that just the slightest disturbance will get it to, to make marks, get trails in essence. So when a, so radiation comes through it, what happens is that you see this little bit of cloud. Later on, replaced by the bubble chamber, which was a superheated liquid, which if something went through it, you saw bubbles in the liquid, as opposed to little clouds as it went through. So they go up to the top of the mountain and they are counting the number of muons that come through. And I was going to give an exact number there, but. And going off of memory, it's 500, I think it's 538 muons. Now, muon is a tiny particle. Muon is mass of about 207 times the mass of an electron. So the mass of a muon, around 207 times the mass of an electron. Oh man, you know, electrons are really tiny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't really, I mean, you don't really think about it. The big difference between these two, besides the mass, is that electrons are more stable. Electron will stay around for a bit. Uh, muons are not particularly stable. They have, we can measure their half-life. And the half-life of a muon is 2.196. Then uh, I'm realizing that's actually the average life span, but we'll call it a half-life. Ah, this is it's gonna bug me. Let me get the real numbers. I know it's ultimately it's gonna be a minor point, but 
I don't want you later on being on the quiz show and they ask you what's the half life and you give them the mean life and they go, no, I'm sorry, you got the wrong one. But my teacher said so. Half-Life also. Oh, sorry, mean life. Half-Life, there we go. 1.56. Times 10 to the negative 6 seconds. So in, in one and a half seconds, uh, there's a 50-50 chance the muon will decay. Uh, one and a half seconds? One and a half microseconds. So that's the half-life of a muon. So if I took a muon and I was sitting right here in front of me, in one and a half microseconds, flip a coin, it's gonna break up or not. The next one and a half seconds, again, another 50-50 chance whether it will break up or not, if it's gonna survive the first time. So they counted the number that came through, and I actually could correct that number right there. 563, that's a three right at the top. Then they went down to the bottom of the mountain and they did the exact same experiment, counted the number down there. So let's predict how many should be counted at the bottom. And you get two very clearly different results, assuming special relativity is true and assuming it's not true. So this is the number count at the top. Oh, this is per hour, by the way. It's not like they had some indeterminate amount of time. The speed of the muons is about 0.995 times the speed of light. In other words, beta is 0.995. So therefore, what is gamma? Point oh one. Oh, no good. I can give you more numbers. Ten point oh one two five. Uh, I'm good with this. How do you how do you solve that? How do you get to the ten point oh one? What do you do? Nick told me. All right, and you're plugging into here. Mm -hmm. It's one yeah, over so one minus beta squared. Okay. One minus beta squared. So you take point nine nine five square it, subtract it from one square root. Oh, so that's right. Mm -hmm. Have it Now the distance that these particles are going to be traveling is 1,900 meters, so it's going to be shooting down. So you count a number up here, you count a number down here. It's a pretty consistent number. These muons are coming from outer space, so you know the muon up here. We're not, they're not tracking individual muons. You just statistically going, how many do we have up here? How many do we have down there? This is 1,900 meters. So based upon non non-special relativity, assuming this classic Galilean relativity is true, I know that speed is equal to distance over time. I know what the, and how much time does it take to get from the top to the bottom? So the time that it would take would be the distance divided by speed, just flipping those across the equal sign. The distance was 1900 meters. And the speed was 0.995 times the speed of light. 368 is sufficient for this. So how much time does it take for the muon to travel down the mountain? It's something times 10 to the negative 6. I think 6.365 times 10 to the negative 5. I got six. Right. Yeah, 6.3 something? Yeah, 6.365. 6.37 is fine. Oh, yeah, okay, so I did 30 million, not 300 million. Ah, all right. So, yeah, it's that. In other words, 6.37 microseconds. So, very roughly, one and a half microseconds for a half life, about four half lives. So, we can do a very crude approximation by 
Half of them gone after one of them, another half gone after the next one, then another half, then another half. We should end up with roughly a sixteenth of what we started with. We can make that more formal by the number that will be at the end, it's just the initial number times the one half raised to the time divided by the half lifetime. So 563 times one half, just the one half is raised to it, of 6.37 divided by 1.56. I don't have to do the 10 times 10 to the negative 6 since they both have it. As long as the units are the same for both of these, we're good. We're both in microseconds right now. Is that multiplied or is it? It's 563 times the one half. So you do one half times to this and then. Okay. 33.213. And that's the number of muons that if. Special relativity is complete bunk. There should be about 33 muons at the bottom of the mountain. Now let's see if, if we assume special relativity, time valuation especially, is valid. Let's figure that out. I know gamma is about is 10.01. The proper time, I never actually did explain what proper time is. Proper it's similar to rest, if you talk about rest mass, that is, rest mass is also the proper mass. It is the mass that you get when the object you're measuring the mass, for which you're measuring the mass, is at rest relative to the observer. So whenever you put something on a triple beam balance, you're finding the rest mass, or the proper mass. The proper time would be the time for Basically, my proper time is whatever I say it is. Uh, if you zip around and come back, uh, we have different proper times. Your proper time still looks like it's driving by once per second. Mine does too. It's just that the seconds are different now. But proper is basically the rest frame. When what you're measuring is at rest. <laughs> 